welcome to today's CEF public lecture. And today we have an external guest, I mean, quasi external, um, Julia Mink, who is an Argelander professor uh, of environmental economics, sustainability and inequality at the University of Bonn. Uh, she is located at the economics department, so relatively nearby to us. Um, her research focuses on environmental economics and health, and today she will present her paper on the long-run effects of war on health based on the evidence from World War II in France. So, Julia, uh, we are very happy to have you here, and the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And thank you very much for having me. I'm uh, really happy to have the opportunity to uh, present my research and to get to know you a little bit because I just recently started in Bonn. So just before I have um, finished my postdoc at the French National Institute for Research in Agriculture, Food and the Environment. And I got my PhD from Sciences Po, so uh, in France. And I just came here last September and started as a junior professor at the University of Bonn. Uh, so it's really great to have this opportunity and show you a little bit what I'm working on and to see probably what you're working on. Uh, so this is really great. Thank you for that. Uh, so today I'm presenting you a project um, that is already uh, finished. So I've been working on that some um, one year, two years ago. This is a joint project with my um, dissertation supervisor at that time, Olivier Allais, and an, who is an economist just like me, and a epidemiologist, uh, Geek Vagarazzi from the Luxembourg Institute of Health. Uh, so I'm very interested in these transdisciplinary projects as well, because I think we can learn a lot from each other, especially when we're doing environmental related research that needs a lot of different disciplines to participate, um, I believe. Uh, so first of all, the motivation. So why study the effects or the long-run effects on health of World War uh, II? Uh, very sadly, this kind of research question has, again, a lot of relevance when we think about the war in Ukraine, um, ongoing wars all over the world. Um, while looking at the long-term effects, so um, exists this um, Doha theory, this development origins of health and disease that states that although um, exposure to uh, environmental um, events or uh, effects have an impact on health all life long. There is this crucial period during childhood, uh, during early childhood, childhood and adolescence, because it's a period where biobehavioral uh, traits are still formed and may have particularly long lasting and important or strong effects on later health outcomes at adulthood. Um, Another point is that research looking at these early life exposure to war uh, on in these long term health outcomes have been uh, less often um, studied in the civilian population. So there's a lot of there are a lot of studies, and I think you know this literature probably much better than I. That looks at um, the relationship between lower birth weight, lower height, self reported health in developing country contexts, but mostly uh, in um, populations that are. Uh, not forcibly civilians, so people who directly participated in a war. So here this paper looks at the effect in the civilian population. So what we do here concretely is to estimate the long run effects on health of exposure during, uh, to, during to, to war related violence during World War II uh, on verified health outcomes. So we have outcomes that have been verified by the fact of people having to take medication, let's say for hypertension. So that's not self-reported, which probably um, is good to not have report uh, self-report bias here. And what we do um, is to exploit variation in war intensity at a very fine grained geographical level. So we are at the level of the postcode area in France. To give you an idea, there are about 6,048 postcodes in France. So it's really a variation across space, across space, that, space that's very fine grained. And the measure of war uh, intensity that we're using is the number of French military casualties um, in the postcode area of birth. So this is our main measure. We also have the number of prisoners of war in the postcode area of birth. And we also have the location of bombs dropped um, during the war. Um, what we also do is to control for individual family characteristics that are not commonly available uh, in many studies. To, and we also have a measure of the effect of 
hunger during the war. So what we do in this paper is really distinguish the effects from um, nutritional shortages or hunger related effects from these effects that we hope to capture through our measure of war intensity using these deaths, um, these military, military casualties. So it's really to focus on the effect of the war in terms of violence or stress and not uh, the nutritional aspect. So for the scale and scope of World War II, there's actually surprisingly few research that really exploits it um, as a natural experiment, or perhaps it's not surprising because sometimes it's just very difficult to get the relevant data to look at these things. Um, there are some papers that look at the relatively aggregate levels of Kessinich and co-authors uh, who find an increased probability of, of suffering from diabetes, depression, heart disease. Um, also other studies, uh, Conti, for example, but they focus on prenatal exposure. So we really focus on uh, exposure during early childhood and adolescence, finding effects on um, height, weight, BMI. Uh, the effects of hunger have been studied several times. So Vandenberg is an example, um, or the effects on uh, mortality, um, on war um, induced rise in infant mortality, but not really the effect of warfare. Uh, on self-reported health, income, and employment. I would say the closest study that I would just want to mention, I don't want to, to spend too much time on that, but the closest study to ours is the one from Akbola Yuxo, who looks at the effects of bombing also at a relatively fine-grained level. So this is a study for Germany and looking at the effects, the long-term effects of having been bombed on obesity and metabolic uh, syndrome, but exploring here rather a place of current residents at adulthood and not the place of birth. So I think we're doing a bit better here because we really have the data on uh, place of birth and use this to avoid misclassification into treatment. Oh, another point um, I should have mentioned already, I am, uh, I don't know how the lecture format usually uh, is, but I'm very happy to answer questions also on the flight if anything should come up. Concerning the background, so here I just want to give the most important points necessary for understanding or for justifying why we're doing what we're doing. So we argue that the German invasion of France is a shock um, that was unexpected. So the defeat of France was relatively quick. It happened basically in some six weeks. So it's this kind of blitzkrieg or lightning war uh, that took place and was also unexpected or at least unexpected in the regions where the combats finally happened. Um, so Churchill, for example, when Hitler came into power was still saying, thank God for the French army. So it was really not expected that the French army wouldn't be able to uh, withstand an attack. And Germany had the subsidiary attack over uh, Belgium, where the French drew their troops up and then uh, the German troops went through the Arden forest that was supposed to be impenetrable, went through there and attacked in places that France wasn't uh, expecting. You, you know probably the Maginot line that was also at completely another place. The French were really expecting to be attacked somewhere else. So the, where the attack happened and the level of how quick it happened um, was sudden and unexpected. So I will, and this is important for the study to say that the regions that witnessed these uh, increase in military casualties should not have been expecting this beforehand. So no significant differences in these regions compared to other regions. So movements of populations before the invasion, for example. Um, just some two more words for uh, concerning this um, explanatory framework for the causal long run effects of early life um, effects um, exposure on later life health outcomes. So these um, models, the developmental origin of health and disease, say there could be latent effects. So it could be that during early childhood, there again, as I said, these barrier behavioral attributes that are directly getting affected by exposure to the war. So stress levels that change something in the hormonal composition or will have latent or direct effect much later in life on, on diabetes, on cancer, for example, because levels of inflation in the body are changed through this exposure to stress. So I just want to mention this here, that there's this epidemiological literature and evidence that supports that there might be these effects of early life exposure to stress, for example, on hypertension later in life, obesity later in life, and also cancer later in life. That may sometimes be surprising, but um, these effects have been um, shown and theorized in this framework. Besides these latent effects, 
there is also the theory that's not forcibly exclusive of each other, that there's this pathway model that people start to be exposed to something adverse in early life and then have an accumulation of bad life experiences because let's say they got exposed, got stressed, did get therefore less education and because of this less education then afterwards so via these life events that got impacted through the exposure have health effects later in life so i try to um, look at these two because i do have health behaviors i do have level of education um, so the idea was to look also at this um, are the effects early in life if yes which time periods and also um can we find some evidence for this pathway model versus this latency model? So that was the original idea with this project as well. So for the data, we used the E3N, E3N, which is this epidemiological study in, at, at the basis. So it was meant, it started in 1990 um, to look at cancer development in women. So this is a cohort study with nearly 100,000 women. Um, when I include all covariates, my sample is rather towards the 30,000. Um, but results stay robust if I do not use uh, include several um, these, these other covariates that reduce my sample. In any, case, in any way, so I don't want to say I use all these 100,000, so my real sample with all um, covariates would be 30,000. Um, but what's interesting here in the study is, again, um, a lot of, so women born from 25 to 50, so exactly the courts that I might be interested in for exposure to the war. Some women who were already born at the moment of the war, some women that were born afterwards. And what's really interesting here is that I have a range of individual and family characteristics. So I have, for example, the socioeconomic status of the father uh, when the children were 14 years old to try to uh, control for some supplemental um, characteristics. And I do have uh, data on health outcome that again is verified. So I know the exact timing of, let's say, onset of a cancer in this data. And here we merge this data uh, from this epidemiological study with historical data. Um, as I already mentioned, not that easy sometimes to find the relevant data or to find proxies that would be sufficiently good to proxy for war exposure. Uh, questions coming up, yeah. Um, um, sorry, but you said uh, we, might, we might ask um, brief questions. Um, mm -hmm. yes, uh, concerning the data, uh, 100,000 women, mainly teachers. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, I mean, teachers after the war or teachers during when you... I mean, what is this in brackets? Yes, yes, oh, thank you. I should have been more clear there. So these are women who were enrolled in a state insurance program that mainly covers teachers. So not exclusively, but it's basically women working in public education when they are adults. So these are women who have been exposed during from age zero to, to five or not even they were born after the war. So from 25 to 50 and then became teachers later in life. So my sample is, and this is why I want to be really transparent here. It's not representative for the French population. What I would argue here is I have a sample of women who are working in the national education. So very likely on mostly teachers. So relatively well-educated individuals probably relatively privileged individuals compared to the rest of the population. Um, so I would expect that the effects that I'm finding here for this population are kind of a lower bound for the effects potentially in the whole population. If this relatively privileged population could somehow get sheltered by their parents uh, from this exposure to the war. Yeah. We mix this epidemiological data with several sources of historical data. Um, and in terms of so measures of the individual's exposure to World War II, in terms of geographical closeness to the war. Um, my main data source that I'm using is the number of French military casualties by location. So this comes from the database that's called Memory of Men, Memoire des Hommes, um, managed by the French Ministry of Defense. So I scraped this data, it's said to be exhaustive. So it's all mi French military deaths by uh, post-cold level location. So again, relatively fine-grained to know where exactly, at what time there have been so and so many deaths um, of the French military there. In addition to that, I have the number and loca exact location, so geocoded of the bombs dropped during the, um, during the bombing of France. And finally, also try to uh, use the database on the French prisoners of war 
um, a bit more complicated because these are archives. I tried with this optical character recognition to get some part of the base uh, of the French prisoner of wars, which are just very long lists with names and place of origin of these uh, prisoner of wars and find some effects for this too, but it's not my main database. So really the main database is this more exhaustive um, collection of French military deaths at the postcode level. To give you an idea for the so the health effects I didn't even mention yet uh, what I'm looking at so um, cancer, um, infarcts, diabetes, angina, hypertension, and obesity, and I also combine these health outcomes in a indicator variable that's just simply one for any health condition and zero otherwise. I have some health behaviors or so some behaviors related to your health. So if people engage in sports during childhood, I have some. Uh, later life, so hours of sleep, smoking. I also had alcohol, but I think the data wasn't good enough. I had to take that out. And some information also on later life nutrition. Um, my treatment variables, so the variables that are constructed from these uh, historical data are the deaths between 1940 and 45 of these military uh, people and deaths per 100,000. And in the end, I will use the, the logarithm of, uh, of this. Other covariates that I've in here again, I had I have some information that I control for, for example, for the incidence of cancer, if a relative had cancer. Um, I mean, typical control variables that you would potentially put in there uh, for looking at the health effects. Again, I think what's interesting, potentially the socioeconomic category of the father when the children were younger, which has been shown to also correlate uh, with health outcomes later in life. Um, number of siblings if someone was born preterm, for example. So several interesting variables that I could also uh, have as controls in here. Finally, so big data uh, work on this project was here is, is um, the result from the how the spatial distribution by postcode error of these French military casualties looks like. So deaths by 100,000 at the level of the postcode here in 1940. Unsurprisingly, you can see, or um, I say unsurprisingly, I mean, the, the attack happened from kind of the north through here. So this is unsurprising that to see that deaths, military deaths are concentrated kind of in the north, um, northern area here. Uh, and you, you have an idea here of how fine green this French uh, postcode level is here as well. Also to say what I'm actually looking at is really a treatment that's very concentrated in time. So the Battle of France really happened from April to, I mean, from May to June, actually. So, so here, May to June in these red um, boundary here. And we really see here, I made the difference between the northern occupied zone, uh, because this zone would become occupied by the Germans after the invasion and the southern unoccupied zone. And you really see that casualties, military casualties really go up exactly in the time that we would expect, and also in the northern zone exactly where we would expect. So the data seems to correspond to historically what we would also uh, expect to see. For the Allied bombing of France, as I said, we have the exact uh, geocode. So this happened a little later, um, 43 to 45, uh, with the exact location of the bombs dropped that I'm showing here. So a bit more here also in the north. And I'm constructed several distances to the bombs dropped as so several measures of war exposure, depending on the distance again, here also for bombs. Uh, the origin of the prisoners of war, this seems not to be really spatially very concentrated except for a bit here in the Bretagne region. But as I said, these data, this data is probably a bit less reliable because it was scraped differently and it's not exhaustive. So again, I don't want to, I have some results, but don't want to interpret too much in it. And another um, interesting variable, and it was a variable in the beginning that I was more interested in was the level of hunger during World War II. Yes, please. Uh, could you please uh, verify whether you have three different variables for uh, war intensity, or do you just use one and the other for the other two? Or yes, yes. Um, should probably have put the model first and, and said exactly this. Uh, so I have, my idea was to try several different measures of war exposure by closeness to the war from three different sources. So generally I have three different sources. I have the bombing, I have the prisoners of war, and I have these military, military casualties. And from these three sources, I tried to 
um, produce different kinds of measures to see if there's if it's robust or not. So for the prisoners of war it was, for example, just the number of prisoners of war that I had in a postcode area. For the bombings, I tried hard because I didn't find in the end any effects of the bombing exposure here to have the exact location of the bombs, to have the number of bombs per postcode area, to have the distance in kilometers from a bomb. So again, one source, but different measures that I tried out. And for the military casualties, I was really didn't matter how I constructed the measure, if it was in absolute numbers, if it was in logs, if it was in numbers per 100,000 of the population, the military casualties gave me qualitatively similar uh, results. Yes. Uh, talking about our trials and our construction, mm -hmm. um, at which time do you measure I measured them from the age 42 until the end of the observation period, which would be age 70 around, I think, or a bit, a bit older, actually. So from after age 40, let's say. So it's really results later. Exactly, exactly. Um, and these women were enrolled in 1990, so they were in between 40 and 65 years of age at the moment of enrollment, got this baseline um, um, questionnaire that they filled out, and then they were followed also medically every, I think, two, three years. Attrition was 20% about and stayed then stable. Um, and then up to, so from 90 to 2000, I think 14, if I'm not mistaken, I have the data until then included in there. Okay, so coming to the model. So what we try here is to really rely on this relatively fine grained spatially measure of war exposure uh, in the sense that we compare health outcomes for women later in life who were born in postcode areas that were more intensely affected by the war <coughs> compared to women who were born in postcode areas that were less affected by the war. So a first difference, so to say, belonging to the same generation. And then with respect to generations that were before, born before and after, supposing that we will, we should see normally some cohorts that are not exposed at all because they're born after the war and some cohorts that have been exposed more intensely to the war when if they were born in postcode areas that were geographically um, experiencing the, these violences that we proxy through the number of um, casualties at the postcode area. So what we do is to look at health outcomes later in life, so 40 to um, until the, the people are not uh, in the base anymore due to death. Um, on the exposure, the different measures, and here I will mainly show the results for this um, logarithm of military casualties, number of military casualties over 100,000 um, people in a population. Uh, and what interests us here is this uh, exposure times the generation that we expect to be exposed to these effects. So it's this generational um, dummy here is equal to one if the individual I, for individual I born in um, year T, if this individual is then part of the treatment generation by the birth cohort they are in. Um, in addition to this, we have time fixed effects. We have um, either the postcode or um, department fixed effects and a range of covariates that we also control for. And here, uh, the important thing is for this differences and differences framework that we have parallel trends in the treatment and in the control group prior to the event. So ideally what we want to see is if um, there is if there normally we would expect that there should be no differences in health outcomes for women across postcodes if they were all born in generations that were not exposed to the war. So what we do here, we interact our exposure measure with um, a dummy for the courts born after the war, for example. So from 1940 to 1945, and also a court that was uh, that was born even later, so 46 to 50. And we do not see that women in postcodes they were more intensely affected, intensely affected as of our measure of military casualties in uh, during the invasion of France. Um, are not having different health outcomes than women born in these less affected postcode areas, which should be exactly the, the, the case. So this is kind of a placebo exercise so to show that after the war, these courts that should not be affected by our treatment have in fact not a different health outcome than the individuals that were um, born during the period that we think uh, should have this impact. 
Interestingly, we also don't find effects for women who were born from 25 to 34. So these women were uh, five to 10 years of age during the invasion of France. Um, perhaps it could be, so we have the place of residence at birth. It could be perhaps that there was some internal movement of people for people who were aged 10 to 15 years, perhaps they moved away from their birthplace and we measure treatment then not uh, exactly anymore. Or it's just simply that potentially there's really, as this Doha theory says, this vulnerable moment of exposure that apparently is children, at least here from age zero to age five. So we really see a different impact in health outcomes for women born in these more intensely affected postcodes compared to women born in the less intensely affected postcodes for the generations that were born um, in 35 to 39 and therefore zero to five years old at the timing of the invasion. What we now do is to look, and this is the main specification here with this interaction term, is to see uh, here this treatment effects, our main treatment effects, so women um, born in the affected areas versus women born in the non-affected areas or less intensely affected areas. Mm -hmm. So this difference compared to the differences in women born in these affected versus non-affected areas in other cohorts. So we compare this, so differences and difference framework to generations born even born before and born after. We have this, so I should have said this here, this is any health condition. So we find that, let's say for a 10% increase in the number of military casualties at the postcode uh, area of birth per 100,000 individuals, that we have a 0.08 percentage point increase in um, health, uh, in any health condition later in life, knowing that the population mean is about 94%. What we also did, because we have different health um, categories or so different health uh, conditions, we looked at cancers and found some effects and in metabolic disease. So this metabolic disease, uh, it's common to group certain conditions like hypertension, obesity, infarctus, um, have I forgotten any, uh, together. Um, because they're commonly occurring health outcomes and we do find that we have effects for cancer also and this metabolic disease. Once we go at the level of one precise health event like hypertension, for example, unfortunately, we don't find any statistically significant results anymore, which could be due to problems of power, for example. Also graphically, just to show, because it's kind of an event study, so to say, uh, so we really find the effects really for the cohort that were zero to five, not for the cohorts before, and for the cohorts after also not. So we really find this difference in health outcomes for the women in the more exposed ex postcode areas versus less exposed only for, the, for, for this cohort, zero to five ages during the invasion of France. Another question that we had was perhaps uh, by these results could be driven perhaps by the women who were the most intensely exposed, which would make sense potentially if the shock is really very strong. Uh, and we were constructing quartiles of exposure. Um, so here these results are with respect to the first quartile of exposure. So women who were barely exposed to the first quartile ranges from zero to 14 deaths at postcode level uh, per 100,000 um, people. And we see here that with respect to this omitted category of the first quartile of exposure, that the um, effects seem to be concentrated here in the fourth quartile of exposure. Ah, it's with some lag here, it's okay. Yeah, I mean, down here. Um, and that it seems so that our results seem to be driven really by the women who experienced the strongest exposure. So really places where they, as, as we measure again, the measure of uh, war intensity of military casualties um, at the postcode area. For the prisoners of war, again, um, I was even thinking if I should um, probably not put it in here because I think it's less, less well measured because this prisoner, the, the prison of war, so when, when I have the um, number of deaths per 100,000, I can have it in the absolute number log in in these intensity quartiles, I have relatively robust results. When I used the measure of prisoners of war, that's not the case. So what I did here is to have an indicator variable where I have above average number of prisoners of war in a postcode area of birth of the person versus um, 
below average. So when I use the absolute number here, for example, of prisoners of war, I do not have um, any statistically significant results anymore. But prisoners of war is also seem to have some effect here. Uh, for bombing, I have a complete absence of uh, results, no matter how I constructed um, this, this measure. So uh, for the magnitude of the effects, I was already uh, saying that, so a 10% increase in the number of deaths per 100,000 inhabitants in a postcode error of birth increases uh, the probability of having any health condition later in life by the 0.08 percentage point, where the, where the sample mean is 94%. Uh, for um, forty nine percent. Sorry, this German number is coming up again. Um, this seems perhaps a bit small, but if we look at the most exposed category compared to the least exposed category, we see that this is already more towards a four point five of almost five percentage point higher um, for, um, chance to have to suffer from any health condition later in life, which already is a bit larger. Uh, so the, because here I'm looking at the um, continuous variable. Um, so exactly here, um, as I said, we have limited evidence for adverse effects for using this prison of war and nothing for uh, the bombing. So the, we were thinking hard about that and we think for the bombing, it could be that bombs were really um, strategically dropped in places um, that are um, military um, places, that are places of war, production and that population could avoid these places potentially and it was also happening later in a war so potentially people could avoid these events better than let's say the violence that they experienced from the sudden invasion of the Germans um, during the Battle of France. Um, for the potential channels and pathways, so we have a measure of war exposure or intensity to, to exposure to the war that's these number of military casualties at the postcode area level. So this is relatively fine grained um, and helps us to exploit this, let's say quasi, um, so this, this plausibly exogenous variation or exogenous with respect to um, personal characteristics, but it does not really allow us to say which clear pathway or what exactly is impacting um, the, 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 um, the health outcomes. So this measure of number of military deaths could be the stress from having been close to the battle and having to flee finally from the battle. It could have been witnessing directly violence. It could be just a stress again from, from material deprivation while one is running away from, from the invasion. So these things, unfortunately, we cannot really uh, pinpoint, but it, I would say it's some kind of um, stress from this conflict happening nearby um, compared to nutritional shortages for which we do control. So that's something separate. Uh, the number of prisoners of war, we interpret the, the, the evidence that we find as potentially some impact from psychological stress of having put a higher likelihood to grow up without a father or another male uh, relative, probably also lower resources because of, of uh, one less bread earner in a household. But again, I think um, less to interpret here. The results are robust to um, these nutritional shortages, these self-reported um, self hunger. Um, so we really capture all I would want to say here, something that is war-related, um, war-related stress, violence, but not these nutritional mm -hmm. shortages. Um, for these pathway models that I said, so we have health-related behavior, and I try to see if this exposure to the war has an effect on, let's say, education, or an effect on later life, smoking, drinking, um, nutrition, but didn't find any effects. So this kind of, so probably there are some effects and this pathway model is happening. So people who got exposed behave differently later onward, but I couldn't find that in the data. It could probably be that I have this very or relatively homogenous population of teachers or mainly teachers who all got more or less the same kind of education and probably have the same kind of health behavior. And to find these things and to investigate this more, it would be really interesting to have some population samples that are more representative, I would say. Uh, one last thing, because I have no clock here. I don't know how long I've been talking here. Um, so as I mentioned, it's not uh, representative here, the sample. Um, 
for selective mortality, which is um, a point that comes off, up often, I would say, so we have a sample that's not representative, but I would say it leads rather to a estimation of a lower bound of the effects because this is a population that's relatively privileged. For selective mortality, if the least healthy would have died, so people who were born in these very exposed um, places, if these have been, would have been more likely to die, then we would also find um, that we have rather lower bound of an estimate because the most the sickest individuals are just not in our sample anymore. So again, what we find probably are just is just a lower bound of the total effects. For selective fertility, so the courts conceived just before should not be affected. Um, for the women born after 1940, we do not find differential effects and health outcomes between those who were in these postcode areas that had all these battles compared to postcode areas that were less intensely affected. If anything, what could have happened is a selective fertility that would have led to women in these postcode areas that we flag as being more exposed, um, being on average a bit healthier through this selective fertility compared to women from the other postcode areas to offset any potential negative effect that otherwise would have existed in these postcodes exposed versus less exposed after the war. So yeah, just a general discussion about um, other points that could uh, affect the results. So here, what we uh, try to do as best as good as possible is to provide this hopefully convincingly relatively causal evidence of these long-term effects of war on health outcomes. Um, I think it's interesting to see that a period of a relatively short period, so just these um, almost six weeks or a bit two months had these effects. Um, and these relatively long lasting effects on health. I think very generally, I mean, again, the context of war that's happening right now in Ukraine um, is to keep in mind, we, it's generally shown in the literature that um, war, the effects of war on capital are relatively short last, but on human capital apparently are really long lasting and would really need to um, invest in human capital in the children that are the most exposed potentially as we show here, um, that it's mainly the individuals who were exposed during their first five years of life. But I do not want to, to um, exclude that there are effects also for the women who were older at the time of exposure. Probably you can just not capture it in our data. Uh, in terms of policy implications, so again, uh, post-conflict interventions that are potentially geared towards this very vulnerable population, knowing that anything that can offset these effects potentially can have um, in lasting impact on health much later in life, age 40 onward.